<laughs> Good. All right, are you ready in media streaming? Bright lights. We're ready? All right. Welcome to the keynote for ShmooCon 2014. It's our great pleasure to have Ian Goldberg here. Ian is the inventor of Off the Record, also known as OTR Messaging. He is chairman of the board of directors of the Tor Project. He researches privacy and security at the University of Waterloo and all around great guy. So thank you very much for coming in. Hi, I'm Ian, and I'm an academic. It's been two months since my last paper submission. So I'd first like to thank the ShmooCon organizers for inviting me to this. This is my first ShmooCon, and I've enjoyed it so far, and I'm going to be here all weekend, and uh, I hope to uh, talk to a lot of you about uh, stuff that interests you. So. I want to uh, start by uh, telling a short story about when I was in high school. So when I was in high school, I used to do these math contests. A lot of you probably did these math contests, right? Remember? And these math contests often had problems that involved the current year in them, right? So back in the day, it was like 1990-something, 1980 right? <laughs> 19... <laughs> Okay, so um, it behooved one who was doing these contests to know certain facts about the year, such as primarily the factorization. So I just got in the habit of every January just learning the factorization of the year. So the year now, it's 2014, we're just into 2014, and 2014 has an obvious factor, two, and then it has this other factor of 1,007. And you look at 1,007, and it's a four-digit number. It ends in seven. No obvious factors. That's how you tell if something's prime, right? <laughs> so it's probably prime, right? But it turns out it's not. 1,007 is 19 times 53. So not only is it not prime, it's an RSA modulus. I'll be it a pretty crappy one, <laughs> really short bit length. Um, but what I'm saying from this is 2014 is going to be the year where things are not what they seem on the internet. Okay, so over the past half a year or so, uh, we've started experiencing a lot of new information. We've learned a lot of new words, right? Words like prism and quantum insert, and egotistical giraffe, one of my favorites. <laughs> and just yesterday, dish fire, right? If you've been following the news. We just learned a new word yesterday. So all of these new words, right, are these programs that NSA, GCHQ, and other intelligence agencies are using in order to collect data about not only targeted individuals suspected of wrongdoing, but everybody, okay? And this is a problem. So there are two uh, types of these, of these programs that have all these crazy words, and, and there's so many of these crazy words that the Electronic Frontier Foundation, shout out, woo! Um, made a nice little crossword of them. So you can go, so you can go do this crossword if, if you think your, your knowledge of all these new words is good, right? So there are all these programs, and some of them are, uh, I'll divide them into like active and passive, okay? So active programs are where the, the intelligence agencies are actively modifying traffic on the internet, things like quantum insert is 
one of the programs in that category. And those programs generally go after targeted individuals, right? They want to look at your traffic and so they use quantum insert to, for example, redirect you to a site that serves you malware or something like this or intercepts your, your data in some way. Then there are some other programs, things like their muscular program, which are passive and untargeted. They're just slurping up all the data they can on the internet about everybody and just either analyzing it on the fly and or just storing it in these big data centers that you've probably heard of, right? So there's a, a lot of these programs going on that are quite concerning to should be everyone, right? And all these programs have made sad cat sad, <laughs> okay? Hmm. Sorry, sad cat is sad. So, what we're going to talk about today are what can we do, right? Knowing that this is going on, even the people who are really jaded and said, oh yeah, we, was this really a surprise to anyone? We really knew this? Yeah, it was a surprise, right? We've, I've been paying attention for decades on to this stuff, and the scope and depth of these programs was a surprise even to people who've been paying attention, right? That they were watching the internet, sure. That they are monitoring all the, uh, what we learned yesterday, all the SMS communications and abusing the English language so that not only does collect not mean what we thought it meant, right? If you remember from a little while ago, uh, the the government considers data collected when a human analyst looks at it, right? So the fact that all this data is in their data warehouse, according to them, it's not yet collected. I don't know what they call it, but it seems that it was collected and stuck in a data warehouse to me. And similarly, they say they only collect metadata. And just yesterday, we learned that they have this new thing called content-derived metadata. So if you weren't reading the news yesterday because you were on your way to DC or whatever, so they have this, this program that we just learned about yesterday that they read all the, not all, but a lot, like 1% of the world's SMSs. And of course, reading for content, that would not be allowed. But if the SMS contains information like, oh, you're now roaming, or, oh, this is a credit card number. Oh, I don't know why people would send credit card numbers over SMS, but apparently it happens enough that they watch for it. Or, oh, you're, you're saying you'll meet this person at this place at this time, that's now considered metadata somehow. So they collect the metadata which really means they grab all the data and store it in a data center. And then if at any point in the future you come under suspicion, they can then go back in time and look at everything you've ever done. Right? So what we're going to talk about are sample technologies you can use either today or hopefully in the near future, we'll look at current and up and coming technologies that you can use and hopefully help your users use if you're in, if you're in uh, a commercial environment where that kind of thing is your job, um, in order to protect your privacy online, okay? So, the, the technology that's been used for this purpose for the longest time is probably well known to you, PGP or its newer open source cousin, GPG. Right, who here's used PGP? Yeah, a lot of people, right? Who here's used it correctly? <laughs> I bet you're wrong. <laughs> Okay, so PGP, of course, so the first thing is, of course, PGP only protects the data 
and not the metadata, right? It doesn't protect who's talking to whom. It only protects the contents of the messages. So that's one thing just to remember. But let's put that aside and say this is a tool we want to use to protect information about who is talking to whom, primarily in email. Okay? So why do I claim it's not used very well? Well, first of all, it's not used very commonly. That much, I think, is clear to everyone. Not many people use PGP, this audience notwithstanding. We have a kind of a selection bias going on here. But over the general population, people don't generally use PGP. And why is that? Well, certainly there have been like formal user studies that have shown in the past that the versions of PGP that were around at the time were hard to use or hard to use correctly, even the graphical versions with the clicking and the whatever. Um, so there were, there were even results like um, people who were computer savvy, they knew how to use their computers, were put in front of the new version of PGP and asked to send a signed and encrypted email and uh, almost all of them were unable to do it correctly and worse, some sent a clear text email but thought they had sent an encrypted email, right? And that's even more concerning, of course. But is that really the reason why lots of people don't use PGP? Is it that the majority of the population has tried PGP, said, oh, this is too hard to use, and then abandoned it? No. The reason they don't use PGP is because it's not the default thing that happens in their email program. Right? The power of defaults is strong. Email is generally an insecure protocol. PGP tries to turn it into a secure protocol. But now we have two email protocols. We have an insecure one and we have a secure one. Okay? The insecure one is the default and the standard and only a few weirdos use the secure one. Right? We are weirdos. <laughs> Yay, weirdos. <laughs> Okay? Only, only a few people use the secure one, right? So you could say, well, what if the default were the secure one? And some people would go even further. There's a, a, another security researcher, Ian Grigg, who has his hypothesis three. And his hypo it's one of seven hypotheses, but his hypothesis three says there should be only one mode and it should be secure. There should not be an insecure version of a protocol and a secure version of a protocol because users should not have to choose which one they want to use. Users don't go to their computer and say, I want to send a secure email to Bob. They just say, I want to communicate with Bob. Maybe I want to send an email to Bob. But they're not thinking about the security. Right? What we need to do as technologists who perhaps design and build these, these systems, is give them security and privacy perhaps against their will, right? They should not have a choice because all these programs that are slurping up this data wholesale from the internet aren't going to care what the user thinks about whether that particular email needs extra security or extra privacy or whatever. And of course, the person sending the email is not only making this decision on her own behalf, but also on behalf of the person she's sending the email to, right? And so uh, it would be beneficial for everyone if email in this case or whatever pro protocol, we'll talk about a few others in a few minutes, um, we're just secure from the get-go, right? There's a, uh, a meeting at the end of February um, by this new working group from IETF called STRINT, um, Strengthening the Internet Against Passive Eavesdropping or something like that. And uh, I have high hopes for, for this group. Basically, the idea is going to be that, what I hope comes out of this, is that going forward, the IETF should not, in my opinion, ever again 
approve an internet protocol that sends plain text over the internet. And it turns out this isn't as hard as it sounds, right? If you're willing to live with encryption that is secure against passive adversaries but not active adversaries, then if you're familiar with the techno lingo, you just do a quick Diffie-Hellman at the beginning of your connection and go from there, right? It's not very hard. It's not secure against an active attack. You can have an active man in the middle against such a thing, but you're way better off than the current situation, which is sending plain text. They're there. <laughs> right? Okay, so this is, is what I hope happens. But PGP has another uh, issue with uh, being used correctly. So even the, those people who do use PGP, I claim very few of them use it correctly. And why do I claim this? So how do you know what Bob's public key is? You're trying to send a message to Bob. How do you know what Bob's public key is? You're all familiar that you use PGP with the web of trust, right? The idea is you have contacted Bob offline somehow and gotten a copy of his key and signed it. Or maybe you don't know Bob directly, but you know Carol, and Carol knows Bob, or something like that. And there's a trust chain between you and Bob. So most people who use PGP have not built a strong network of trust. They have not gone to the PGP key signing parties. They have not signed a lot of other people's keys. So what do they do in practice? They go to the key server, or their, or their PGP program does it for them. It downloads a key, and the key has 20 signatures on it. None of them are yours. In fact, you might not have signed any of those 20 people's keys who signed that key, and you might not have a trust path at all to that key. But it's got a lot of signatures. It's probably the right key, right? <laughs> okay, here's an experiment I've been wanting to do for like 10 years and never got around to it because I'm a professor and I'm way too busy. But I'm throwing it out here because I think it might be fun for one of you. So, here's the experiment. You go to one of the PGP key servers. You download all the keys, right? Just download the entire list of keys from the PGP key servers. Now, for every key in the list, you make a new key yourself that has all the same properties as the other key. So it has the same username, it has the same email, it has the same creation date, it has the same type, it has the same key length but the value of the key is different because you're just going to create a new key yourself. So you'll create a public-private key pair of the right type, and you do this for every PGP key in existence. Okay, so you have all the private keys and a whole bunch of new public keys. Now for every signature in the real web of trust, you make the same signature on these shadow keys, okay? So now you have a web of trust whose graph looks identical to the real one. And now what do you do? You upload it back to the key server, right? <sighs> I just heard someone swear. <laughs> right? So now whenever anyone queries a user uh, email address, they'll get two keys, the real key and your shadow key, okay? And if they look at who has signed each key, well, it's exactly the same. And the only way to break this symmetry is if you actually use PGP correctly. That is, you do have a trust path from yourself to one side, which will presumably be the real key. And I say presumably because what will inevitably happen? Some user will download a key, it will be the shadow key, and for some reason, they will sign it and upload the signature back. And then you start getting these cross signings from the real web of trust into the shadow web of trust, and that will make it even harder to figure out what's going on. And that's, as they say on TV, hilarity ensues.
Okay? All right, so the next technology I want to talk about is probably the most common um, privacy enhancing technology on the internet today, and that is SSL. Now, SSL has a couple of big uh, problems, in my opinion. It's mostly good, right? If you, if you use good key lengths, if you use forward secrecy in your uh, cipher suites, then SSL is actually pretty good, but it has two major problems. One has to do with browser implementations. If anyone here works at a company that makes a browser, please take what I say and bring it back and tell, keep telling people until they fix this, okay? So, watch the screen. Which screen is scarier, this one or this one, okay? Let me show you again, this one or this one, all right? Which one is scarier to the user? An ordinary user is browsing the web and comes across this screen or that screen, right? Let me explain what these are. This is a blog with a self-signed certificate. This is a bank with not using SSL. Okay, and this is, I didn't do anything tricky here, right? Now, this bank, of course, if you look in the, I can use the mouse here, if, if you look up here, in the, if you look up here in the upper right, there's a lock, right? The lock means secure. In fact, there are actual user studies that show that uh, a user will consider a website secure if there is a lock anywhere on the page. And indeed, the larger, and I'm not kidding you, shinier the lock is, the more secure the site is. Locks must die. <laughs> Users do not understand what locks mean, okay? If you can at all throw away any lock icons from your products, get rid of them. Users do not understand what locks mean. Okay, now what's going on over here? This is a blog with a self-signed certificate, and you'll have to click at least like two or three more times in order to read the blog. Okay, this site is, this site is clearly the scarier one to the user, right? But which site is more secure? Right? This one is at least secure against passive adversaries again. Right? So someone who's just slurping up all the data but not interfering with it will not be able to read what's going on in this connection once you click three more times to get through the scary box, but will be able to read what's going on here. Okay? So again, What we have is that the, the unencrypted protocol is the kind of standard or default protocol. And what logically should be happening here is if a browser is going to present a scary dialog box for a self-signed certificate, then logically it should present an even scarier dialog box for any non-HTTPS connection at all for all HTTP connections. But of course, that would be a usability nightmare, right? No browser would ever do that. So this is what I'm telling browser makers. Get rid of this dialog box. If a site has a bad certificate or self-signed certificate, show it to the user anyway, but just don't tell them it's a secure site. Show it to them exactly the same way as if they had gone over plain HTTP. Okay? The user is protected better than if they had gone over actual HTTP, but not 
as well as if you had full SSL with all the proper CAs and all of that, and all the proper certificates. Okay, and that's true what I hope, I talked about strength, that's what I hope will be true for all protocols going forward, right? Where you would have sent plain text, now just do a quick Diffie-Hellman, send encrypted data that's secure against passive adversaries, but don't tell the user that. As far as the user's concerned, this is still an insecure connection. Okay, unless you do something else to authenticate the endpoints, right? Which is a separate conversation, but is also not so hard to do in many cases. But even if you don't do that, do the encryption, but don't tell the user, right? As far as the user's concerned, they have an insecure connection, but as far as the snoopers are concerned, it's an encrypted connection, and that is the best place to be, okay? So again, if any of you are browser makers, go do that. You have a question already. Is there a question here? Okay. The other issue with SSL has to do with the CAs, as you're probably all aware, right? So we have this famous issue from a little while back where Diginotar signed a certificate for Google.com, right? That was not a real certificate, but it was trusted by browsers because Diginotar is a real CA that's trusted by browsers. Browsers trust hundreds of certificate authorities from all over the world, okay, that are run by uh, governments of countries you might not expect to be running CAs that could sign certificates that are valid everywhere um, by various companies. But it's, it's even worse than that, right? It's not only that there are hundreds of CAs trusted by your browser, but each of those CAs can create an unlimited number of sub-CAs. And each of those sub-CAs can basically man in the middle of the entire internet. Okay? And we see this in commercial products. We see commercial products that are sold to companies that allow companies to man in the middle their employees' SSL connections so they can inspect them, right? And the way these boxes work is that they contain a sub-CA that has been signed by a real CA, and then that CA just on the fly creates certificates and man in the middle's SSL connections. And this happens at companies and did I say companies and employees? Maybe I meant governments and citizens, right? It certainly may be happening there too, and almost certainly does in some countries, right? So the whole CA model is in a great need of overhaul, and certainly there's ongoing work to address this. Some of it, of course, certificate transparency by your own Ben Laurie, and uh, Adam Langley and Amelia Casper um, is a very promising uh, approach and we're all looking forward, I don't know if Ben's in the room, but we're all looking forward to uh, seeing, oh, there he is there. Uh, all looking forward to uh, seeing how that goes. <clears throat> Excuse me. <coughs> so the next thing, I want to talk about is OTR, or off-the-record messaging. Who here uses OTR? Bunch of people. So OTR <clears throat> allows people to communicate online using instant messaging in a secure and private manner. And it has, um, we estimate about uh, 350,000 users. Of course, that just counts people who download the OTR Windows installer binary from our primary website. So it doesn't count mirrors, it doesn't count the Linux and BSD software distributions that come with it, it doesn't count um, uh, IM clients that have OTR built in. We'd love to know how many people use OTR, but it turns out putting user tracking software inside privacy software 
for some reason is frowned on. I, I, I'm not sure I understand that because we would like to know. No, we of course don't do that. Um, but hundreds of thousands of people use OTR um, to protect their instant messaging conversations. And there's been, uh, if you follow uh, OTR and some related technologies discussion online, there's been some uh, debate lately about some of its properties. So OTR, of course, provides for encryption of your instant messages. That's its most obvious use. It also provides authenticity. If, if Alice is talking to Bob, she knows she's really talking to Bob and not some imposter or man in the middle. But it also provides two other properties. One is called perfect forward secrecy. I alluded to this earlier. If you're not familiar with perfect forward secrecy, it's basically the property that the private keys that you hold, your private, your private crypto keys, cannot be used to decrypt messages. They are only used to authenticate you, okay? Because if you have long-term decryption keys, that are stored on your disks, stored on your backups. If you lose control of your laptop, if you get your laptop subpoenaed, if you get malware and someone steals your keys, they can not only then read your messages going forward, they can read your messages going backward. So they take all the messages they've recorded you saying, which were encrypted and are sitting on a hard drive in Utah, and that's where they're sitting. If only they offered a recovery service, like. <laughs> but it's sitting on a hard drive in Utah, and they can take that private key that they get from you and decrypt all those past messages, if your private key is a decryption key, right? So perfect forward secrecy is the property that if your system is compromised now, then past messages are still secure, right? Um, so that's uh, a property that OTR provides, which is good. And the fourth property is deniability. Now this has gotten um, a lot of people maybe a little bit confused or misunderstanding, so I want to clear it up. So uh, some people, when they hear that OTR has deniability, they think that, oh, if I'm using OTR, then the transcripts or the communication or the chat logs cannot be admissible in court or something like that. But that's crazy because plain text chat logs are admissible in court all the time, right? The point of OTR's deniability property is that while Alice is assured she is talking to Bob and the, and the messages are authentic while the conversation is in progress, the transcripts offer no cryptographic evidence. And so if OTR chat logs were to be offered uh, as evidence, it should have exactly the same weight as testimonial evidence, right? Just the same evidence as if they were plain text chat logs and you just have to take the word of the person who submitted them that they didn't mess with them. Okay, so OTR's deniability property just means as deniable as plain text. You obviously cannot be more deniable than plain text. And this is becoming a, a uh, more technical and detailed question going forward because now we're starting to talk about multi-party OTR. So OTR right now is only for communications between two people. But a lot of people are wanting some way of securely communicating in a group or a chat room or something like that, have private chat rooms. And that's something we've been working on for a while and just earlier this week there was a conference up in New York called the Real World Cryptography Workshop and we had a number of meetings that, if you follow this, you might have seen tell on Twitter, that we've really moved the multi-party OTR and similar secure group chat protocols forward. So this is one of these things that I'm hoping you'll be able to use in the not too distant future in order to protect your communications online. So another protocol that lots of people uh, use online today is of course Tor. This slide is uh, from one of the leaked uh, 
uh, slide decks from Edward and Snowden, uh, you'll notice this U, that means the fact that Tor stinks is unclassified, <laughs> even though the rest of the slide deck was classified. So what does Tor stinks mean? It's that the NSA hates it when you use Tor. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> okay? Now, so to be perfectly clear, Tor has been known since day one in its, its original design documents. Tor never claimed to be secure against an adversary who can watch the entire internet. As it turns out, the NSA does to a large degree. But from this slide deck and other uh, Snowden leaks, we see no evidence that the NSA knows how to break Tor in any way that we didn't anticipate. So that's good, right? Tor still is, of course, known to be vulnerable against a global passive adversary. And for that reason, uh, if the NSA is a uh, adversary in your threat model, uh, Tor may not be the right solution for you. In other situations, Tor may be a good solution. Uh, so be somewhat careful. Uh, there's certainly uh, places where it is definitely useful, but other places where you might want to think twice. But the, the nice thing of the slide deck, again, is we see no evidence that there's a cryptographic problem or any, any issue that uh, allows the uh, NSA, GCHQ, those type of people, uh, any advantage in breaking Tor that we didn't already know about. So that's good. Um, one other uh, kind of upcoming technology that I want to talk about is uh, private information retrieval, or PIR. And this isn't really in use today, but our research group uh, is actively developing this. So what is PIR? So this is intended to protect your private information against the server you're talking to, okay? So this is meant to protect against like a prism type of attack where the, the security agency goes directly to Amazon or something and asks for the data that you requested. Okay, so what is PIR? So imagine, for example, a database of patents. There are lots of online databases of patents, as you probably know. So let's say you're a researcher and you want to look up a patent, and you want to look up patent number 6368227, method of swinging on a swing. Okay, this is a real patent covering pulling on the chains of a swing alternately in order to swing sideways. Okay, look it up. It's a real patent. I'm serious. <laughs> Yay, patent office. <laughs> okay? It has since been revoked because people pointed out it was stupid. <laughs> <laughs> okay? It was a real patent. So, but you don't want anyone to know that you are interested in researching swings, okay? Even the database you're downloading it from. Now, this is a silly example, but instead of uh, swings, let's say you're interested in some alpha-3-dioxy, some large chemical name, right? Some pharmaceutical patent or genetic patent, right? If you're looking up to see, has anyone else patented this thing? Then if the database learns about that, well, suddenly they know this is an interesting thing. Okay, so what PIR allows you to do is to query an online database without letting the database itself learn anything about what you asked for. Now you're looking at me and saying, that's clearly impossible. Well, here's, a, here's kind of a straw man argument to show it's not impossible. So, 
you make a TCP connection to the database server, the database server sends you the entire database of patents, and you look it up yourself, right? That protocol clearly leaks no information to the database server about what you asked for, but it's a ridiculous protocol, right? <laughs> the data transfer is totally inconceivable. You keep using that word, I do not think it means what you think it means. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what PIR protocols allow you to do is, surprisingly, achieve the same privacy property while transmitting way less data, okay, at the cost of extra computation. So you're trading off computation for communication while maintaining the same level of privacy. And there are some other trade-offs too, but, um, so this is upcoming technology that we hope will allow people to be able to perform tra transactions online without even revealing to the server they're transacting with their personal information. Okay? So, as I said, this isn't in common use right now, but where uh, we have uh, a library that does this called uh, Percy++, P-E-R-C-Y++, you can Google for it and uh, you can play around with it and see uh, if this could have some use in your organization. All open source, of course, because that's the right thing to do. Great, so, so far, all the technologies we've been talking about have been uh, protecting the data on the wire. Okay, so we've been assuming the adversary is in the network. A long time ago, um, a security researcher, Eugene Spafford, said that using cryptography on the internet is like hiring an armored car to send information from someone who lives in a cardboard box to someone who lives on a park bench. And I, was, I always thought he was talking about the abysmal level of operating system security, that it's so easy just for an adversary to own your endpoint through some kind of remote attack that any cryptography you do is meaningless because they'll just read the plain text straight out of the endpoint. And that probably is what he meant, but recently, along with all these Snowden things, we've learned about a new word, again, and that new word is interdiction. So interdiction, if you notice this from at Villox, made this very nice graph. So interdiction is when a targeted person orders a computer from an online site. Interdiction is when that computer is intercepted in the mail or in UPS or whatever. Back hardware or software or, or BIOS or whatever, back doors are inserted into it before it's delivered to the customer. Okay? Now you're all thinking, oh, when did I last order something online? <laughs> right? You all get your computers by, by flying to a random city, zigzagging with a couple of people who look just like you, and you all enter random stores and buy things for cash, right? <laughs> just off the shelf. Yes? That no, no one does that, right? So interdiction, this is a little scary, and recently we also saw that whole TAO catalog of these almost mind-blowing uh, attacks on uh, systems, on endpoint systems, right? Things that Back in the day, like two decades ago in the 90s, there was this persistent rumor that uh, network interface cards, Ethernet cards, when they received a specially crafted Ethernet packet, they would execute the code in it. And that was a bit tinfoily at the time. Now they just call it wake on LAN. <laughs> right? And and now we look at this catalog and we see, yes, these are, these are real things that governments can just order from catalogs and deploy against end systems, be they routers or endpoints or whatever. And 
Uh, this is pretty scary because you're all, I'm sure, familiar with the concept of a trusted computing base or a TCB, right? A TCB is the smallest piece of your computing system that has to be secure in order for your whole system to be secure. And ideally, you want to make the trusted computing base as small as possible so you can check it, okay? But these targeted attacks mean that what you thought was a trusted computing base, your smartphone, your laptop, your home computer, might be compromised after all. Now, luckily, these targeted attacks are just that. They're generally targeted, right? So they're not the kind of attack I talked about at the beginning that is trying to snoop up, sweep up everyone's data. They're going after specific targets. So that's not as bad, but what if there were attacks against TCBs, against common commodity chips that are used in all kinds of computers that have been sabotaged from the get-go for everybody. And a lot of people are thinking that the random number generator in, in x86 chips, this has happened to. And this is really scary, right? Um, people have said that, oh, but we've actually looked at the random number generator uh, under an electron microscope, the circuitry, and it's fine. It's what we said it was. But, and you think, okay, well, do, A, do I trust that they did it? I didn't do it myself. I don't have an electron microscope because I'm a software guy. But worse, there was this pretty scary paper out of the University of Massachusetts just a couple of months ago that said, oh no, look, here's how to fab a chip by misdoping the silicon such that it looks fine under an electron microscope, but it has a back door. It's like, what? <laughs> How do you even check for this? Right? So